ones which were found from fungi so these ones when we say antibiotics we are actually excluding sulfur is not an antibiotic sulfur is a chemical compound but we use it very often similarly you have some of the penicillins which are semi synthetic we learned from penicillin and then we made some analogs of it chemically so those are truly not antibiotics they are antimicrobials and antibacterial is any compound which obviously kills the bacteria so it's a subsection of antimicrobials if you see what is the earliest description of use of or evidence to see that these were ever used it's been shown in sudan that if you look at the skeletal remain from the what have been excavated they could find evidence of tetracycline in the skeleton so it may have come from water itself who knows because we know that tetracycline labeling is used for to determine bone growth so tetracycline can stay in your bone for years together they could have come from the water contamination or something but otherwise the story starts from 1900 and the first compound was found for syphilis and we'll see how things moved forward and this was actually the golden era of antibiotic discovery starting before the second world war and the whole impetus came by the second world war because there were a lot of people having injuries infections so to save them there was race against time to get more and more antibiotics and we have most of the antibiotics which we are all aware of which we use in day to day practice like starting from penicillins aminoglycosides tetracyclines nitrofurantoin cephalosporins and then came your cyclosporine rifampicin and other drugs and finally in 1960s we had the quinolones but after that the story has been very different and these are the drugs which have stayed with us and they have really saved lives but unfortunately people like us who arrived late we are the ones to blame why these drugs are not so effective now and this is the reason why you need to have an antibiotic course or antimicrobial course because the mechanism of action of different agents is different so if you want synergy you need to use two drugs which have a different mechanism of action there's no point in combining antimicrobial which have the same mechanism of action second you need to know that what is your spectrum of infection or which organism are you suspecting or at least one or two organisms which you think are the probable cause of infection in this individual and you target those organisms not having a pan microbial approach which is going to give you more antibiotic resistance the third is pharmacokinetics like there are certain drugs which you don't like ever to give in children a drug which has to be taken four times a day would a child like to take that never not even an adult will like to take that so you try to use drugs looking at what the frequency if a patient is hospitalized it doesn't matter you might give it four times only there is excess workload for the nurses but for patient it doesn't matter because the patient is lying in bed route of administration for children generally you don't prefer to give intravenous drugs you like to give oral drugs because they, are, they don't like injections similarly depending on where the infection is you have to decide which drug will have more concentration in that area like for urinary tract infections 
you would use drugs which will get concentrated in the urine so that you need to use lesser amount of drug same is story for adverse events or contraindication some drugs are contraindicated in liver disease so obviously in those patients you can't use or in renal disease or with some other diseases like when we are giving patient azathioprine you can't give allopurinol certain drugs have a drug interaction and interaction with other antimicrobials so you must look at the drug before you need to know the drug so darpan is sitting here so we were telling them that you don't have the authority to prescribe any drug till you know the mechanism of the drug the immediate side effects of the drug and if you are going to prescribe for long term you need to know the side effects on long term I mean, we have no license to prescribe drugs which we don't know about so thus it's very very important to choose an appropriate antibiotic in an appropriate situation I mean, this i don't need to say all of us have seen how much impact have antibiotics made to our life some of the diseases have really changed I mean, penicillin prophylaxis has changed the whole scenario of acute rheumatic fever and consequent rheumatic heart disease nowadays people find it difficult to teach in a medicine wards you don't have patients with rheumatic heart disease how do you teach undergraduates about murmurs unless you walk down to the cvts ward where you might have some patients who are still getting operated you don't find patients so that much difference has come like sepsis previously before the second world war everybody would die who had sepsis because they were not effective antimicrobials and now you see our ccm ward or our most of our ward in our hospital at least 10 to 15% of patients would be the ones who are admitted just because of sepsis and at least 50% of them would make it and will leave the hospital meningitis meningitis has totally changed when I mean, the sequelae which we used to see for meningitis has almost disappeared and because we can also make diagnosis very early in patients with bacterial meningitis and some dis diseases as is shown here have totally disappeared from certain parts of the world not from our country but at least from fair part of the world tuberculosis syphilis and many other diseases surgery I mean, surgery has absolutely changed even in the 40 years since i have seen I mean, the amount of infections we used to see earlier have really reduced and the amount of antibiotics which is used in surgery is also reduced tremendously i don't know how many of you are surgeons but nowadays they just give one peri operative antibiotic shot and maybe one after that that is enough now previously patients would be getting 7 to 14 days of antibiotics and then drug resistant bacteria coming in and more and more problems so as i showed you the discovery of drugs or antimicrobials simultaneously actually the drug resistance has come in so the lower panel is showing you the antibiotic resistance when it was observed and when the drug was deployed in the clinical practice so you see it exactly follows as soon as you deploy the drug the resistance sets in and as banani said the microbes are much more intelligent than us they have been in the world for much longer period than what we have been so they have much better strategies to combat these antimicrobial agents so we need to be smarter only in a way that we prescribe in a more efficient way so why do you get drug resistance we will have a detailed lecture on that so i'm just giving you a glimpse of it so whenever you have an infection it's that some of the bacteria in that inoculum are drug resistant so when you give antibiotics the drug sensitive bacteria die off and there is a selection of the drug resistant clone or drug resistant bacteria and they multiply so all of you must have read that most of the antimicrobial resistance is actually plasmid mediated and when after you given the drug these get selected and they can also be passed on to the other bacteria and there you can multiply that can have a multiplier effect for drug resistance so the bottom line is the more the drug is used the more likelihood is that you will develop resistance so the message for you is use antimicrobials sparingly use only when it is needed 
It does not mean that the person has entered the portals of SGPGI or the ward block that the patient has to be on an antibiotic. Or a patient has to have an IV cannula inserted as soon as the patient is admitted into the ward. So those are the sources of infection and the more antibiotics we use, the more resistance we are causing. So how much is the increase in antibiotic usage in our country? So this is according to the study which was published in PNAS long years ago, but it is still valid that between 2000 to 2015, India actually is one country, obviously because of our population also. It doubled. The amount of antibiotic usage has doubled as shown as defined daily doses per 100,000 population. And if you see countries, in most countries, it has doubled or it has increased by 1.2 times. So most of the countries, it has increased. But in our country, it's been a tremendous increase. So these are the common antibiotics which we use. Cotrimoxazole had become a drug of no usage. That is why the straight line is almost a straight line or it is coming down. While the other drugs, like keflosporins, they are the, probably the most misused drugs, followed by fluoroquinolones. And macrolides are not so much misused, but now with COVID pandemic, you've seen, every Tom, Dick and Harry has taken azithromycin, even knowing that it has no effect. But even physicians are taking it. It has hardly any antiviral effect at all, of a significance. And if you see this, the carbapenems are not used anywhere else. No other country, I think, except in certain countries in South Asia, that you can buy it off the counter. It's only in our country you can walk across to any medical shop and even buy meropenem, imipenem, anything is available. You don't need any prescription from a physician. So this is showing you how much is the increase in the use of carbapenems in our country. It's just galloping. This is still 2010. And even after that, it has increased even more. So all the antibiotics, if you see the poor countries do worse. So this is showing you data in India from 2005 to 2010. Again, everything, all drugs are being overused in our country. And similarly, if you use more drugs, as I showed you earlier, you will get more and more drug resistance. And you see the amount of resistant bugs we are having. MRSA is one major issue in every hospital. And same is vancomycin resistant enterococci, chloroquine resistant organisms. And this is two recent studies, if anybody of you are interested, they are published last month in Lancet. One is Lancet Practice Health. And what they show is that you see how much of antibiotic usage is there. This is data in children who had lower respiratory tract infection in less than five years of age, where generally you don't need antibiotics, actually. Most of them would recover on their own. And India is here. So almost 65% of those episodes are treated with antibiotics in our country, as compared to Western countries where it is about 20%. And how has it changed over years? So this is showing you the world data. This is predominantly showing data of low and middle income countries. So if you see in 2000, we were somewhere here. I think we need to concentrate only on our country. Like if we can do something for our country, that will be best. So the antibiotic usage in this age group with lower respiratory tract infection was somewhere around 30 to 40%. Oh, thank you. So 30 to 40% varying from different parts of our country. If you go down to 2005, it has increased further. Now it's between 45 to 50%. You go here, now it is between 60 to 70%. And now we are becoming more and more blue. And the more blue you are, 
you are reaching around 80 percent and what is it now this is 2015 i showed you and this is 2018 so we have become very blue means we are between 75 to 90 percent so every child who gets a lower respiratory tract infection who actually doesn't need antibiotics most of the time is being prescribed antibiotics so if we prescribe so indiscriminately they're going to land up in problem so what this paper shows which is published last month that we need to get this longitudinal data and this would help us make a policy to tackle inappropriate antibiotic usage and it also looks at i've not gone through the whole paper and shown you the data because it also tells you how much is the discrepancy between haves and have nots so there is areas which have very poor usage and if you will see in our country itself that the southern states have more usage of antibiotics they are much more richer states the north india or the bimaru states have much lower usage because their patients don't have access to health care so there the physician doesn't get a chance to prescribe if he had a chance he would have done like the same so this is another paper which has appeared in january this year in lancet and they are looking at antimicrobial resistance where do we stand we are here so we have so what they have calculated is that how many deaths can be attributed to just antimicrobial resistance that means we as physicians are the culprits for those deaths it's been calculated that about 5 million deaths in the world in 2019 happened because of us just prescribing these antimicrobials and leading on to antimicrobial resistance and in india or in south asia it is thought that about 75 deaths per 100000 person is caused by antimicrobial resistance and these are the absolute numbers and if you see the, the purple bar shows you the deaths due to antimicrobial resistance and these are associated with antimicrobial resistance and this much you can attribute and these are directly related to the dark one is they are totally attributable to the resistance and what are the common pathogens where you get drug resistance e coli staph aureus that is methyl resistant staph aureus klebsiella pneumoniae strep pneumoniae so, and acinetobacter bomini these are five most common organisms but the maximum number of deaths which are attributed to drug resistance are basically because of methicillin resistant staph aureus so what does resistance lead to if you have more drug resistance you will have increased cost of treatment so if you don't have resistance so this is a ratio is calculated to the first line drugs because we know that when we have resistance we use what you people call as higher and higher antibiotic actually there is nothing called a higher antibiotic actually it is sad that we have to use those antibiotics so if you use second generation third generation or fourth generation antibiotics the cost goes on increasing the most difficult thing that are pipeline i showed you that we had drugs like quinolone after that from 60s to 80s in 25 years we have been able to get only six new new antimicrobials while here we were getting very fast and after 1990 actually this pipeline is totally dry we don't have any antimicrobials coming and we are prescribing more and more causing more and more drug resistance so what is going to happen so this is the editorial in lancet last month it says that now is the time to repurpose a global fund to tackle antimicrobial resistance and the who says that this should be one of our priorities as a top 10 global public health problem 
we need to understand the misuse and overuse of antimicrobials. That is what we are trying in this course. But Banani asked me to speak why we need to have the course. We need to have the course because we want to avoid misuse as well as overuse of antimicrobials, in, at least in our hospital. Because the cost of antimicrobial resistance is significant both to the patient and the society and the government. And without effective antimicrobial, the success of modern medicine in treating infection, especially major surgeries and cancer chemotherapy would be at risk because those patients definitely are at risk of having infection. So we want to save these antibiotics for those patients. We don't want to use those antibiotics in a routine practice. So thus, they have put it as one of the sustainable development goals. And what can you do as a physician? 70% of antibiotic prescriptions are likely necessary. This is the data from CDC. And at least 30% are absolutely unnecessary. That they are not needed. No, no antibiotic is needed in 30% of situations. And this is for community acquired pneumonia. Only in 21%, this is data from US, that an appropriate antibiotic was given. In majority, it was inappropriate. So what is their target? Their target is that we should educate enough our physicians so that 90% would at least have appropriate antibiotic choice for an appropriate duration. So we are also hoping that if we can achieve this 90% target in our hospital, we will have a much, much less drug resistance, cost of therapy, and other problems. So you always ask a question when you prescribe, do I really need antibiotics? Do I really need to prescribe antibiotics? And say no if infection is not caused by the bacteria. Say no to antibiotics for viral infection, for upper respiratory tract infection, for viral diarrhea, for COVID pneumonias, which we have been prescribing, I don't know what. I had not heard of those drugs before I moved into the COVID ICU to look after that ICU. So I had not heard of Atta, Zevi, Septa, and funny, funny drugs. I heard for my first time in my life. So antibiotics are only needed for treating certain infection caused by that. So that is why we need this course that through history, infectious disease have been a major thing in our life. Antimicrobials, as I showed you, have been really a good advance, both for surgery as well as medical management. But in discrete use, antibiotic resistance and a poor new antibiotic pipeline that we don't have much. If you hear the person who described Omicron variant, what she says, she says, in the next wave, people will not be dying of COVID. People will be dying of bacterial infections caused by resistant bacteria. So to avoid that, we need all your help. So that is all what I have to say. And if you have any questions, I don't think you'll have questions on this kind of a lecture.